Hello, and welcome to Office Hours. This is a show about media and virtual production. We have a talented panel ready to answer your questions. So go to officehours.global if you'd like to participate in asking our questions. That's where you get to be the producers and guide the, uh, the gist of the show. Ordinarily, we'll have a second hour during the week that deals with a specific topic. On Saturdays, we have Education Saturdays. We have Dave Trotman here today, here to talk about distance education. So we're looking forward to that. Stay with us after our first hour. We'll transition, bring our educators in, and then talk about education. Mitchell, what do we have? First question in from Mark Giuliani in Washington, D.C., and here on the panel. Yesterday on a Zoom call presenting plans and drawings on them using the Alex Lindsay Telestrator method with a MacBook Pro 13 presenting a PDF and a downstream key. Viewers found the resolution too low. Any suggestions? Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, before the show, I just wanted to get some clarity. So I was pinging Mark in um, Discord to see if he could send me the file so I could load it into my system and see what it looked like. And what we found during the questions were uh, I asked uh, what was the meeting? Was it a 360p meeting, which is you know, a standard account? And he said that he was on his 1080 account, but he was just joining their meeting. So the meeting is hosted uh, the resolution is by the host's account so if the host account is a, a free or non-paid or non-boosted account that they haven't reached out to uh, to support you might want to ask them to do that so they can get 720 minimum and more like 1080. Um, the other thing though if I was in that meeting and it was just a one-off and I wasn't going to do those again is I would actually just go into share screen and then go into the content from second camera and that'll bump your resolute or it'll bring your resolution in uh, full but it will give you low frame rate. So you just go into share screen, then you hit the advanced tab. So it'll, it, when you first go to share screen, it'll be on basic, but you go to advanced and then there's this content from second camera and then you can uh, pick which camera you want to pick. So that is the answer. Thanks for that insight. I know that Zoom says there's no reason why any of us should be on a 360p uh, account, um, but I still keep a portal around just for that uh, last minute pull in uh, to bump something up at least to 720p. Go ahead, David. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the reason is it goes back to old school uh, video conferencing things where you would have to weigh the call for motion or still. And I think that's kind of that work, not workaround, but the workflow using the second camera puts the content that's still in at a, like I said, a lower bit rate, lower frame rate, and it's just weighted differently in the call for sharpness. Alex? Yeah, and and yeah, you're absolutely right. The bit rate stays the same um, and it just lowers the frame rate to make that work. Now, one thing that I've done in the past, because in the past that that share was, and I haven't used it for a long time because I have a, other, a different workaround. <laughs> so um, so it may, uh, it may be 1080 now. It used to be that it was limited. Even that second camera was limited to 720 to get that last little bit of resolution or as much resolution as I wanted. And this will screw up your records, but... Um, what I, if you don't do it correctly, is what I do is I actually use a camera input into QuickTime and then I share the QuickTime screen. And so basically it forces it, I do a screen share of the QuickTime window that is that is using my switcher as an input. Um, the, the key thing you have to be careful of there is that you wanna put that on full screen on a 1080p monitor so that it stays in the right frame. Otherwise, if you, get the QuickTime not quite in the right space or you or you don't capture it correctly, you could end up with a different aspect ratio. Anyway, so but the um, uh, it, it, it's worked since day one almost. <laughs> so so and I have to admit that I, I played with the other one and I thought that it was doing 720. This will do 1080. Absolutely. Like it'll put it out. And if you make the screen bigger, it unfortunately you have to again, the reason you want to stick with 10, a 1080 screen and fill it is to make sure it stays at 1080. Otherwise, you can actually make it much larger. You can make it 4k by accident. Um, because, but it'll be very low frame rate, you know, to, to do that. But if you're just showing stills and you're just drawing over them, it wouldn't matter. Um, it just screws up everybody's records. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so, so that's the, the, that's the way I approach that problem. Nice tip, Alex. Uh, Mark? So if you did use the screen share with the second camera and you're drawing on the Telestrator, is that going to look a little awkward with a slower frame rate? Uh, it depends on if it's moving or not. Um, generally, you're not going to notice it. The frame rate's low, but it's not 
so low that it's like, dit, 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 dit. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just not going to be 30 frames a second. It's going to be like seven frames a second or, or 10 frames a second. If you're playing something, it's going to look really odd. If you're no, these... drawing on something, you probably won't notice it very much. It, you know, it'll, it'll get, it'll make its distance a little bit fast, but I, it, it shouldn't be a big deal. Thanks. And John? One thing I've used to highlight text in a sea of other text is in a slide deck, I will sometimes show the full text as a preview into the PowerPoint or um, Keynote animation, draw a circle around the outside of it and use a, the animation tool in Keynote, I think is called draw line. And so it looks like you're drawing on it. Have another slide after that, that zooms in using the magic move effect and you're calling out that information. So it's much larger text if the issue is too much text on the screen. And I don't know if that's strictly what it is or if it's just a resolution issue, but that might help. And David, did you wanna weigh in again? Just one quick uh, follow-up. Is that advanced camera sharing function addressable via Zoom OSC? Do we know? I don't, I've never tried it. I'm not sure. Mm, good question. Maybe, uh, maybe some of our folks in the chat can pick that up. All right, let's go to our next question. From Hasma Kajar in uh, South Africa. And Peter, when you use Mimo Live with Zoom ISO version 2, are you still using your ATEM for program out? Can you explain your video chain? So, and uh, Peter, Peter, would you like to, there you go. Yep. So the uh, short answer is yes, sort of. Most of the time when I'm using Zoom ISO version two now, I'm actually more like uh, JJ behind the scenes, cutting four or five people in, or actually four people with Zoom ISO version two, the light version into a system and I'm using strictly Mimo Live and then, but I take the output, one of the full screen outputs out of my, uh, out of my Mac Pro, which is where Mimo Live lives and run it into the ATEM. So I can actually get sort of like what you were just describing, Alex, a full screen version of the output coming out at 1080p because when I'm, before the show starts and I hope I don't get a lot of times I uh, am set up like this, where I'm getting the four the four people I'm they're going to be talking squared away in, on Zoom ISO, and then put myself in the upper right hand corner so they can see me, and then I just simply disappear, and that's that's really what I'm doing with it. So yes, I use the ATEM. I don't use the full capabilities of the of the ATEM. To be quite honest, um, I just found that uh, for the stuff I do, um, Memo Live is a very simple, stackable solution that allows me to do a lot of things very quickly and program it because I can use um, uh, the companion module I can use to control it. And I could control a bunch of stuff through that, including uh, Zoom OSC as well. Thanks, Peter. And Alex, you want to weigh in? Yeah, one of the things I'm just seeing how Peter handles his kind of interaction with folks to, to kind of work through that. Uh, it's really exciting to think about when we think about the SDK, the Zoom SDK, we want to think about that that uh, what we saw yesterday with IzzyCast, that's available to everyone. Like what IzzyCast doesn't have anything inside. There's no, you know, uh, insider code. There's no special uh, ring. <laughs> there's no nothing. They have, um, IzzyCast is just using the Zoom SDK as is uh, Zoom ISO. They're just using what's available to every developer. So when we look at what Peter's doing with Memo Live, whether it's Memo Live or Ecamm or vMix, all of them could start incorporating what we saw with IzzyCast into the software that they have natively, um, rather than all the, uh, you know, kind of half, baked uh, WebRTC solutions that have been in most of these editing tools, they can actually have a uh, so solid platform that is built to support them. So it's going to be really interesting to see what next year looks like. All right, let's go to our next question. Simon Rhea from Shrewsbury, UK. I've heard that having more than a certain number of viewers in a breakout room can knock the resolution down. What are the factors that reduce video resolution in Zoom meetings? Go ahead, Alex. I think it's actually mobile devices. So if you if you have an iPad or an iPhone jumping jumping in, you'll you'll go you'll drop down to 720p. It caps it off. There's no I don't believe that there's any number of people that will do it, 
but the type of device, and I don't know enough about Android to, to know whether that it happens there, but I do know that the iOS devices specifically will knock it down to 720. Yeah, I agree with what uh, Alex said. Um, and you may have heard something that I had said about it. I basically said after about 20 or 25 people, chances are you're going to get a phone or an iPad right. that's going to, it's going to join the discussion. It's, it's Somebody's going to um, ruin it for everybody. Technically, you know, of course, you know, you know, it's not something we can do to filter the actual traffic um, currently uh, by any means that I know of. Okay. Um, and the exception to this, uh, the way this works is that Zoom will only create one high definition feed for your audio. Um, and when someone requests it uh, or a client, they will create a high definition feed. That feed will either be 720p or 1080p. So if a client requests a high definition feed but can't support the 1080 like an iPad, or now, um, used to be just iPads could do this, but now we have um, 16.9 um, HD um, uh, 720p contributions are now possible from phones, not by default, but if you turn that on, then they can knock your meeting down as well. Um, so Zoom will only create one um, high definition stream for that particular uh, device. Now, if they're not, if they don't happen to be looking at you, so if you're not an active speaker, you could potentially capture some of those in a meeting that don't have the focus that are being provided for one of those uh, devices. But yeah, chances are after, you know, X number of uh, uh, random people, you're going to get someone that fits one of those criteria. So it's more of an system. odds thing, not necessarily a hard number. It's, yeah. Right, right. Uh, David? It's been a while since I participated in breakout rooms, but I always thought it was forced gallery. So would the change in resolution be applicable because everything's getting squished down to smaller video signals anyway? Um, the way that the gallery factors into this is that if you're not an active speaker, and if you're just if Zoom just has to create a thumbnail view for you, then that doesn't knock down that participant to the 720p. So it's only whenever, let's say, if someone pinned, if you had a 720p device and you requested that device requested it by pinning, then Zoom's not going to create a 1080p. It's just going to create a 720p for that one. So everyone watching that feed will see the 720. And as far as pin, pinning, etc., is applicable in breakout rooms. I've not seen that before. Um. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can pin in breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, you might be thinking of spotlighting, uh, uh, David, or, or probably. Okay. Yeah. Like I yeah, said, I, we, we don't use breakout rooms at work much, so I'm a little ignorant there. Yeah. The gallery view doesn't factor into it, but if, if it is full screen on the device and the device requests a 720p, the, the, the thing is that, um, the, as I understand it, Zoom won't create an additional 1080p. So that's what you get for that participant. What I will say is that if you're, if breakout rooms, if you're doing event production are magical, like it's just, it's just the, it, it is uh, ever, ever, it was one of those things that I didn't think about at all until uh, Grant um, brought it up. Like, oh, we bring people into this, then we do this. And then we went crazy. And now we have just a lot. I mean, even in this show, as you know, we have lots of breakout rooms, but when we're supporting it, being able to have hair and makeup and having a, we have the lobby and then the green room and then the, you know, the post show room for the, for the speakers. And you have all these little all these little areas. It's really, it's great. Yeah. There are some, if you, if you do plan on uh, including breakout rooms into your workout flow, there are some gotchas to the breakout rooms. The breakout rooms do not have all of the features. Um, they don't have all the safety features either. Uh, so you got to think about that too. Um, as far as the security as well. So practice your workflow, uh, do exactly what you intend to do. Uh, if you're planning on producing in breakout rooms, um, there was one other thing, but they're okay. great. They're really good. They are great. <laughs> they are great. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't uh, need to um, chime in like this one more, but I've the behavior I've seen is if I go from uh, meeting to breakout room, breakout room back to meeting, there are occasions where camera doesn't follow, and I have to reboot the ATEM or replug something. And I'm not sure if it's just my own rigs or if other people have seen that. Um, one thing I've noticed is that um, there are certain errors that I'll have, like if I pick two cameras with one digital source and it jams my camera input, there's two, way of fix, two ways to fix that. You can either leave the meeting, come back, or you can go into a breakout room. And I found that that change tends to do the same thing. That's a good tip. If you have a participant that's having issues with either, uh, we've had 
uh, sound issues with their audio and video issues. Oftentimes the fix for that is for them to leave and come back. But if you don't want to send them away from the meeting, one fix is if you have a breakout room available, you can switch them. And Zoom kind of handles that much like, you know, changing changing meetings. It, it, it handles it like changing meetings because it's a lot like changing meetings. In fact, it's almost identical yeah. to changing meetings, <laughs> going from a main room to a breakout room to, or, or breakout rooms. It would be like it would be as if there were a bunch of meetings that were all just clumped together. <laughs> So. Yeah, I, I think I thought of it, the thing I forgot about. So one other thing is that um, to send people into the breakout rooms requires their consent to move there. Um, once they're in the breakout rooms, you can move move them around with without their acknowledging but, the prompt. But um, yeah, moving them but, into the breakout rooms, they've got to go willingly. Which is why you almost do it. The first thing we do is pull people out of that main room. Like as soon as they get in the main room, hey, we're going to move you in and then they approve it. And then, then they're, we never have to do it again, but we get them out of that first, that, that main room as fast as we can. And now with uh, Zoom ISO for a breakout room contribution, unlike Zoom rooms that can only uh, take the pins in the main room, that does open up a lot of options for your, uh, for your productions. Let's move to our next question. From Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida, Jeff asked, big leaps in AI video generation recently. Meta's Make a Video, Google's Imagine Video, and Google Research's Finaki. Where do you see this fitting into your projects down the road? Courtney? Well, it looks like it could eliminate stock video entirely as long as they get the rights worked out. Um, if you look at, uh, like, Finaki here, I can show you. These are some samples there. You know, so it's text to video, kind of like the uh, text AI to stills that we've been looking at. Only this, they train it with video, and the one on the left, and they generate photorealistic uh, video imagery uh, up to a couple of minutes long from just a text description. So uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, the one on the left is photorealistic teddy bear swimming in the ocean in San Francisco. Teddy bear goes underwater. Teddy bear keeps swimming under the water with colorful fishes. A panda bear is swimming underwater. So you can actually, you know, add things and change things, uh, and the video will evolve into that. So you could create your own fever dream just from a text description. <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, Alex? Yeah, so I mean, currently, I actually use mid journey a lot to the brainstorm. So if I'm trying to think about how something like to get out of whatever my preconceived notion is about something, I'll throw a phrase in, oh, I'm trying trying to think about what this might look like. And I'll throw some phrase in and then I'll evolve it. So the big thing with I find that, uh, you know, now that I'm using Dolly as well as as mid journey, um, as well as Diffu uh, diffusion B uh, on, on the Mac, um, diffusion B has been I'm not successful. I mostly just get gray noise. Um, anyway, so I'm not trying to figure out why, but it's, it's not been useful. Um, but um, but with Dolly, it kind of goes, okay, here's something and it's more realistic than mid journey, um, but uh, less evolvable. Like it just kind of comes up, and you, you, whatever it comes out with, you just do it again if you don't like it. Whereas with mid journey, you get four choices and you can you can start to evolve those. It's really built into it and you keep evolving, 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 evolving. The, the And you can get, you can, find something that you're interested in. And it's a mixture of what you like and what it keeps on coming up with semi-randomly, not randomly, but but as a guide. And what I find that fascinating for is when you're thinking about uh, logos, when you're thinking about um, imagery, when you're thinking about those things, just kind of, you know, just playing with it. It's kind of like sitting in front of a synthesizer, <laughs> you know, like to, you know, you're, you're kind of playing with ideas and turning things and seeing how they feel that at some point you can't really direct it, but you can sit there and play with it. It feels very much like a, a synthesizer kind of, you know, looking for, you know, when you're looking for a sound or looking for something you're interested in. Um, and uh, so for brainstorming, I find that it's, it's good. I find it mostly brainstorming for dark things is, is easier. Mid journey seems to um, it can give you ha shiny, happy things, but if you go dark, it goes super dark, super fast. Like things that will give you nightmares, things you can't unsee will come out. Not, not things that are like, um, not safe for work, but just things that you look at it and you're like, wow, that you, you would like, if someone did that at school, you would report them to the principal, you know, if they, if they wrote, if they painted that dark bias training. Here. But people, but, but I, but it's enjoy like, because it's on my phone, because it's just in discord, it's a bot in discord. People will say things around me, like walking, someone walked past their table and said something. I was like, I wonder what it would do with that. And it put it in super, super dark. 
<laughs> so it's so not like it was. And so, uh, so, but I love using his brainstorming. I think what we're going to see in production first is most likely, I mean, one of the things that's really close to the surface at the moment is doing a lot of stuff with um, uh, dubbing. Dubbing is something that a lot of people have been talking about and a lot of people are researching. So what they're doing is they're using AI to analyze the voice and they're basically doing deep fakes to change the, the positions of the mouth to match the dub, to have the dub match the, the actor's um, voice perfectly. So you have someone else feeding in the, the language, you know, talking into it. Um, and they're getting to the point where they're not sure from someone I was just talking to a couple weeks ago, they're not sure if they're going to need anybody to dub the actor. They're just going to be able to, they, you know, they were like in five years, we're just going to be able to type in what the actor needs to say and it will match the expression from the original performance. So the expressions of the original performance with the new voice, with how they would say that, um, is going to be enough for them to, to, uh, um, to get it, they're not going to need a person to do that. Um, which, you know, of course they said, of course that scares you when you think about politics, but for movie making it's, and you want to do it in 60 languages, it's awesome. So, so you know, the, the, our, our problem is not what happens in DC. It's what happens in LA, <laughs> which was how it was laid out for me. So, um, so anyway, that technology is probably the first place we're going to see AI used, um, pretty heavily. In fact, it'll probably be used in every movie within the next decade. Uh, John. I remember once I got a t-shirt from Russia that had a bunch of English words that put together didn't make any sense. But in Russia, they didn't know English, so they sold it as a cool American shirt. And I feel like that's my experience with AI generated art is I'll type in stuff and most of it will look kind of normal. And then there's one or two things that are just way off. So I think the, the skill of learning the inputs for those kinds of tools is going to be a skill that we'll have to learn. And I think the tools will need some ways to edit certain parts of them to say, well, this one little section, this part isn't quite right. Can you try just editing just this one part of this image before it becomes really useful and starts taking over the world? And, and always think about what it's actually saying. Like, like if it does do something that looks like a language, it may be a language. We had a friend, uh, when it, somewhere I worked, uh, we had a, a, a Japanese matte painter and then someone I worked with and, and the, um, the, the someone I worked with bought, bought a shirt in China, in J Japan town and was wearing it at, at work. And the, <laughs> the Japanese mad painter came in, literally the quietest guy in the world, fell on the ground laughing, like just, just dropped to his knees laughing. He was laughing so hard um, from that, that shirt. And, and the, um, the, the person I was working with said, so what are you laughing at? And he says, you're sure? <laughs> he goes, it says, I am stupid American. <laughs> like, it was just like that. So, <laughs> so always be careful of wearing things that you don't know what they say anyway. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think of this as um, Steve Jobs talked about a computer as a bicycle for your brain and their tools. And I think uh, like some of our panelists mentioned, you sort of round round off the errors, rounding errors, you know, the rough edges around something, something that's used for inspiration. Yet another tool, I know a lot of people are uh, scared uh, about that. And we are voiceover second hour. Um, so much of our panelists had, I think, a balanced view about that, but having another tool for aid of inspiration. And it's, I almost think like, oh, I can't draw, but I'm an AI uh, artist operator. You know, I can put in the, the tools that make, make the thing. So interesting specialization we might see in the future. Let's go to our next question. From Hasma Kajar in South Africa, Zoom ISO version two pro. Is it correct that version 2 Pro comes with OSC Pro support? And is there a need for a separate Zoom OSC Pro subscription, which is now $19 per month? ISO version 2 Lite does not need OSC Pro subscription at $19. Oh, it does need, excuse me. Go ahead, Peter. So Hasmus and I were both on the same Zoom test kitchen yesterday, and this was a revelation to us, as was David. This was a major revelation to us because a bunch of us had gone ahead and gotten this moved over version one to the light license and still continued on with our Zoom OSC license. And it turns out you don't. Now there's a gotcha here. If you get, if you have the two separate ones, then you need to keep your source and sync OSC ports separate between the two instances, one for Zoom OSC, one for Zoom ISO, because they will step on each other otherwise. Um, but yeah, that's the way it was explained to us yesterday on Zoom Test Kitchen by Andy. Yeah, fantastic Zoom Test Kitchen. Andy was busy yesterday. So go check that one out if you get a chance. 
Let's go to our next question. Next one in from Paul Valos in Austin, Texas. In the Shoot app, how is audio moved from the phone to Zoom along with the video? Guy? Yeah, according to the manual, it depends on uh, the connection. So if you're connected via HDMI, the microphone button will appear. So if you're connected via NDI, and I just double checked this during uh, the time of this question and the answer, uh, there is no audio on NDI. If you want to get um, something that's NDI with audio, you would just use the the native new tech uh, NDI app that's uh, 10 bucks. Uh, but then you lose your telestration feature, which is why we like shoot. So it just depends on what you want to do. Most people would probably just take audio in through another man or some kind of other microphone. All right, next question. David Brady, New York, New York asked, when building motion backgrounds, what is the easiest and best method to get a nice seamless loop? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, our editors can probably answer this better than I, but uh, what I used to do on motion backgrounds is create a long graphic and uh, move it. And I wrote a program that would move it and you create uh, two copies of it. And as it moves it left to right, as the end of the one is coming up, it moves the second one right to the butt of it. So it butts it up right against the first one and then it keeps moving. So it, you never see a seam go by. Uh, the problem is in creating a motion graphic, you don't want to see the jump cut when it loops. So another another way they do it uh, where there's a lot of things moving in the frame rather than just horizontal is you uh, create about, let's say, a two-minute piece of stuff moving around. And then you do uh, uh, take it into your, time, into your timeline and editor, and you put two copies of that uh, two-minute video on the timeline, and you overlap them by about five seconds and do a slow crossfade between them. And then you put a marker at the middle of the file Actually, you probably put the, want to put the marker at the middle of the file before you duplicate it and put it on the timeline. And then you uh, cut it at the marker, which is halfway into the animation on each side that is uh, that contains the crossfade in the middle. And then if you have a media player that can play back from last frame to first frame without it glitching, uh, then it'll cut from marker to marker and you won't see the jump cut and the crossfade will happen uh, slowly and you won't see it uh, jump cut in the middle. Mitchell? Yeah, Courtney is exactly right. The other thing is it depends on the uh, the type of uh, background that you're trying to uh, to loop. If it's a static, fairly static image where big things aren't moving around a lot, like laterally or whatever, um, you can get away with the simplest way, and that is just to reverse the footage and place that at the end of the main, uh, of the, of the main, uh, main part so that you're actually starting on the first frame of the second piece, which is the last frame of the preceding piece of file. And that works pretty quick if it, were, if it fits. Clever. Alex? Yeah, oscillation will work some of the time. The, 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 the main thing you want to think about if you're doing it with graphics, so if you're doing, trying to do a looping piece of graphic, um, the thing you want to think about is that you have a keyframe at the beginning and what we do a lot of times is you say, I want all my objects to be in this, whatever the orientation is. At the end, I just need to set another keyframe where they're all in the same place again. <laughs> so, so then I can do anything I want in between, but I have to make sure that they all have keyframes across all of their attributes by the end to be exactly the same place. Now, the second problem you're going to have is that you, you need continuity between the first and the, and, the, and the second part. So basically, if you think about a keyframe here and a keyframe here, and the motion vector for this keyframe is going down like this, and the motion vector for this keyframe is going out, is going in like this, not out like that. What you end up with is a, a discontinuity at the beginning. So things will change in their speed at which they're going, which will be will create a hitch that you'll that if you're working on it, you can notice. Um, so you have to be you have to be very conscious to the, that that you have to match the basically the vector you know going through it. Now After Effects has a looping function. And you can actually see the cap in After Effects, you can see the um, motion, motion has this as well, but you can see that uh, motion uh, path inside of your F curves. And in your F curves, you can see that 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 hitch is existing. Um, there's a there's some, yeah, there's some other tools <laughs> that are not available publicly that will let you, um, I mean, the thing to always remember is, is that your, you know, your velocity is a, your your velocity is the derivative of your velo of your position is your velocity the derivative of the velocity is acceleration and the derivative of the acceleration is the jerk 
and the and so what you're looking for is if you can display the 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 velocity and the and the acceleration um, you'll start to see the hitches in places that you wouldn't normally see when you're animating. You can you can you can play with those hitches as you're moving your F curves around because it's an F curve editor, and the F curves are where you really do all of this like heavy work. That's the best way to at least knowing how how that works is is useful. Is animating these inside of F curves with 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 uh, motion points on on both ends. The best way to do it is in motion, Apple's motion, and the reason is is that Apple Motion has behaviors. And replicators and those will just do what they need to do and there's a setting in there that where you can say i would like this to loop every four seconds or every six seconds or every eight seconds so all those things are going to do whatever they're going to do and they're going to very comfortably get back to where they were and be ready to loop every single time it is the most magical background generator ever made like and, there, and you can do it with motion math and a couple other ways and in, inside of after effects but for 50 bucks there's there's certain things with motion that are worth 50 bucks, like the way you do ma countdown clocks, <laughs> what you do and the way you do background, like graphic backgrounds in, in motion are, are just magically easy to put together. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend it. I'll bet you, Alex, before motion came onto the scene, some mathematician figured out a way to loop the DVD thing bouncing off the corner so that it came back to the same point in vector <laughs> at the top of everything. You do it where it hits the, so I've actually done ones where they bounce around. You do it where it hits an edge because now you have a natural, you, you have a natural break in the, in the continuity because it's going to bounce. So anything that's bouncing off of edges is easy because you just find one of those ones where, it's, wherever it's going to end, you just have it start there. It's, it's, it's already, the harder ones are when they have like something like this and it goes up and, and you have to figure out where you're going to, where that's going to happen. So. That's it. We'll all hit the wall at the same time. Yep. All right. Uh, let's go to our next question. From Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, what is on your gear checklist for a cooking show in a home kitchen? Especially discuss how you would do the overhead shots. Go ahead, Alex. I'm going to get one more, <laughs> buy one more Insta360 and then I'll have three. And and that is, I think, going to be, I'm I'm really heavily leaning towards using these little Insta360 uh, pan, pan tilt zoom cameras as my cooking, you know, thing. If I, if we get back into the cooking things, because I, they're like tiny little PTZs. Have um, you that tried I can, the interface with the two of them together? Does it work? I, I, you know, the problem is both of them have not been in the same place at the same time. And I, I do have to get that. I'm picking it up from that, picking the one up at the office. I started use I used the, the 360 for the, um, for gray matter with Michael Krasny. And it's just so, it's so great. <laughs> I just, we were having so much trouble with the Brio and, and it was suddenly like, Oh, I can just fix, fix things as, as he moves or as he gets readjusted, I can just adjust it during the show. It's just really awesome. So it's been down there. I'm going to bring it up here. I'll be playing with it over the weekend. I think you can control both of them. We'll see. We'll see how that goes, but I don't think I need to move it very often. It's just mostly, you know, I do think that, that what's missing right now is, uh, what's, what's missing at the moment is, is really being able to have better control over it where I can set presets without having to jump to a different window. So that's going to be the challenge there. Mm. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how that looks. Um, but, but I'm looking at it right now and, and, and thinking that that might be a, a useful one. It will limit me to a software switcher. I'm probably going to use memo live or something like that to go back into it because, uh, or Ecamm or something like that, because the, uh, uh, because I, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have an HDMI out, uh, but I'm interested to do it. The main thing is, is that you need for me, what I need is one camera for me to look at it, to, to look at and talk one camera. That's, that's really overhead of what, um, and I had four, I had one that's overhead of the, uh, of the cooking surface and one that's overhead of the preparation surface. So those are the two things that I had to have overheads of. Then I had um, one of me, and then I had one. Um, I, I was doing these all with iPhones when the last time we did it with Demyanti. And so with the iPhones, I had one that was sharing um, to an Apple TV, and the Apple TV was going into my ATEM. So, and that was, wire, that was like my wireless camera. So it was just like I just literally had, at the time I was using Filmic, I just had Filmic, and I could just pick up that camera and just zoom in on something. So by having something on my preparation surface, having something on my uh, cooking surface, and having something on me, with with kind of a wild card, I, I can't show you this with the cameras I have. So let me just grab onto this and make it make it look good. Anyway, that's been the approach that I that I started this kind of settle into uh, for that for cooking shows that we've done for Master Chef and uh, William Sonoma and so on and so forth. Uh, we use a, um, a heavy duty amount, very large number of PTZ cameras 
usually running across a crossbar on the other side of the island. So, and sometimes over, on the, over the shoulder to come down over this way, but usually we stay all on one side. So we have basically a speed rail that goes across and we hang anywhere from three to five PTZs that are going to be managing different angles. And we usually try to get the cooks to rehearse so that we can um, figure out where they're, uh, you know, where they, where are they going? And then we have a checklist that we have to have these PTZs and pre presets to get to where we need to go. I keep trying to justify buying the 360. The, the non HDMI input is kind of a, it's a bummer. Movie. If, if yeah. they come out with a pro with an HDMI, they'll, they'll sell as many as they can make. It's yeah. the color reproduction is way better than the other cameras as well for what it, it's got way better color control. I will say though, that with, you know, for a plug in PTZ camera, you know, all software based, that's a pretty uh, light lift. And if I'm not mistaken, Alex, the, um, the down, the tilt down function is sufficient enough to where you could have a single never camera. Used it. No, I, I, okay. I haven't used it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's kind of, uh, I think that that along with Apple's version of it and everything else, I think is goofy. Like I, I just, just like, you know, like the weird, you know, like I just, if I'm going to use it, I'm just going to hang one over top of what I want to do. For, you know, rather than try to have it do some down thing. I mean, I, I can understand why consumers would want to do that. But if I'm going to do it, I'm just going to have one that's another one that's hanging over top of what I want to show as opposed to um, trying to do something funny with the one in front of me. I've, I've used that actually at work. I'm sorry to jump in with yeah, my hand. But uh, it's pretty cool. It does sweet keystoning on the fly. So for demonstrating something on the table to colleagues in a Zoom meeting, it's quick and easy to just point it at the thing and and go, you know. What's your opinion of the camera overall? I love it, you know. Yeah. The, my only the, the downside I have too is that it's not Zoom room capable. So it doesn't do right. the presets in Zoom rooms like I was hoping for. But, but I'm yeah, okay. curious to see what you do with, uh, I saw something where you're, you're planning on the, the Interatron with it. I want to see what you do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so yeah, I was trying to, I'll try to show it later. We were talking about it and what we had done with the 920, for those of you who didn't see it with the 920, we had it. Um, we, we basically vacuum formed plastic around the 920 and then ran a cable up to it and it just was smack against the glass. And this guy is so, the, the, this guy's so small that we think that we can do the same thing where we just build like a little cavity for it to sit in and then set it in there and then vacuum form it to the back of a, of a teleprompter glass. And then you just pull it up and it's done. And because it has PTZ for it, everything will be in focus unless you have some odd lines, light lines. You know, it's going to be amazing, I, we think. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, the rumor has it there's a device that does uh, USB to HDMI and then passes the USB onto the computer. For I ordered the, one. Uh, I'm waiting okay. for it to come in. There there it Osbot. Is. What is that called? Osbot makes it and it's, um, I, I'm waiting for it to arrive. So it's, it's a, it's a USB to, if you do Osbot USB to HDMI. Um, so we'll test it. If that happens, then we now have the pro version <laughs> of, of, the, of the, of the thing with, and it'll be $169 more than the, uh, than the regular one, which is what I said, you know, what we could do. I mean, the only other thing I would add, of course, is a larger sensor, like just go keep going with that sensor size. I think that the, what they did is pretty amazing. Nice. Well, let's go to our next question. Vic Hernandez from Springfield, Missouri, a little confused on viewing office hours from an after hours breakout room. There were two breakout rooms, quiet and test. I joined quiet, but it looked like mostly camera on panel members. Was I lost? Well, if you join the test, you're going to see repeats. So that's where we do our 24 hour ISO testing. And once you've seen it once, you don't need to see it anymore. So come over to the quiet viewing session in after hours. Go ahead, David. With the ISO test room, um, does access have to be granted each visit or is it once you're in, you have the privilege to... to... Once you arrive and once you log in to Zoom, well, uh, right, you right. need but that I... before entering. Okay, so it's a per visit to that room. You have to be elevated to allow record. It's per not login. A that's not a persistent thing. Okay, got it. Right, per login. Yeah, you can go from room to room without needing to, to refresh that. Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, Mickey Makachor uh, mentions the uh, Office Hours Quiet Movie Theater is where people go to watch Office Hours. The Zoom ISO test sources room is where the test loops are, and he assumes the test room is where Vic went, not the Office Hours Quiet Movie Theater. 
yeah. So like I said, you'll, you'll see that once and then you don't need to see it again. It's just repeats for us testing. Let's go to our next question. Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida is back. Audio video sync through Zoom part two. Easiest way to correct for delayed audio and add a delay to video. Tested bypassing audio chain by switching Zoom to the Max internal mic. Use Zoom original audio with noise and echo cancellation turned off. And I know Jeff does a lot of the audio for his voiceover. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, you know, there's the easiest and the best. I mean, the, the best way to do it is to find a way to separate your audio from your video and then to have independent delay on your audio. Your audio is generally going to be the thing that is ahead. And uh, we've talked about it before. It's the, the one thing our mind doesn't correct for. If your video is a little ahead, it won't bother us because we're used to that because we lose a millisecond every 10 feet anyway. <laughs> so so um, so our brain has been correcting for that for a million years. And so it doesn't really bother it. Um, but if you go the other direction, there's no part of nature that looks like that. So it, it, show, it pops out as a problem. Um, although I think a lot of people have gotten a lot more like they don't Audio sync doesn't bother people as much because they spend too much time in Zoom and, and blue jeans and everything else where no audio is in sync. But uh, your the easiest way is probably something similar to what you said. The best way to do it is to find a way to separate your audio and your video chain and then delay your audio independently. Next question. Johnny Estias in Manila asked, loving my Sonic Deck Link COD with Zoom ISO version 2, I was wondering if there's a way to send one of the Deck Link inputs to receive an output from my ATEM and use it as a webcam feed into Zoom. I believe it depends on which one of those you have. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I was going to say, which, I was about to say that. Which, which do you have? Because you can... Certainly on the extreme, you can take one of the out, one of the inputs and send it straight to output. Um, you can you can pick pick which one, either output one or two can pick up any of the inputs. But you would need, depending on the deck link card, he might need some conversion hardware in between because I, I mean I have technically what's branded a deck link card, but it's HDMI. So I can HDMI, I can HDMI capture on my deck link card any of the outputs from my uh, either of the two outputs from my extreme as an example. But I think on the SDI cards, you have to set them up correctly for either input or output and then convert appropriately. Go ahead, Alex, real quick. And we actually use that when Andy came to our office and was talking to you, one of the, his way of showing that, that those pieces where we had one output coming out of the switcher, the SDI switcher going back into the, in our case, the, um, the quad card, but the duo or the quad, you know, those are bi-directional. So you can definitely set one of them as an input um, to send it back in. Fantastic. Let's go to our next question. Asma Kajar in South Africa asks, has anyone played with video pencil from Michael Forrest installed on my ad iPad, but to use it as a telestrator need to understand NDI. In Mimo Live, I could pick up the iPad in the NDI receive settings under discovery sources. Now what? Go ahead, John. I have started using the application. I haven't gotten into the NDI settings yet. Um, I know that there's been at least one video um, that one of our office panel, <laughs> office hours panelists has um, put together on how to, the basics of using it um, with NDI. So you might go to YouTube or Discord. There's some instructions there. What I will say is there's definitely something there with this application. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk about Telestration at a future Education Saturday. And go ahead, Peter. The other thing to remember is if you, since he's asking about Memo Live, besides Memo Live being able to receive NDI, it can send NDI as well. There is actually an NDI output destination that you could pick your program source for a specific destination and send it back to the send it to the iPad. So you could be you can be receiving what you're sending over Memo Live as well as sending something to me my life. I haven't tried it yet, I, but at least the bones are there to make it work. I just be afraid I get into some sort of infinite loop. It might be nice to be able to see what you're looking at uh, from the app. Let's go to our next question. David Brady from New York, New York, and right here on our panel, ask looking for a travel case for my trusty Kensington expert mouse trackball. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I have the same one. <laughs> so, so the uh, uh, one of the things to note is that there's a lot of things that are made for it, a lot of things that you can print for it, which means that there's models or or things that are there. What you want to look for are 
is there somebody, and I, I started looking for this for this question, I couldn't find it immediately, but if someone built a 3D model of this, which I'm sure someone has because they built all these other things on it, um, that you could then, having the 3D model um, and then taking it into something like Blender or Cinema 4D or whatever, once you have the 3D model, a lot of times what I do is I, I print something that should be right on top of that model and I print that out and then I put it on top of whatever object I'm trying to build. So a lot of them, if I'm building like stands for the Mac, for the A10 mini, um, I'm building a new one right now. And, and I, uh, what I do is I get an eight, enough of a model into the A10 mini, uh, or the, of the A10 mini into my three package in my case, cinema 4d. And then I start building everything, but I make sure that everything registers exactly the way I expect it to. Then once I do that, I can now, um, just sit in, in my 3d app and build whatever I, whatever I'm looking for. Um, to make that work. So the key is getting a model of a, a rough enough or an accurate enough model of what you want to cover or build something around into your 3D package and then build those on. You don't have to be, I mean, the kind of 3D modeling that you need to learn to do this would take a weekend of, of YouTube and and uh, a little bit of swearing, but, but mostly just YouTube um, <laughs> to figure it out. I mean, but it is not, these are the basic booleans with, with uh, solids. You know, it's not going to be a super complicated um, thing to do. Go ahead, David. I'm good at this. I'm good at the latter of those things for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't have a printer, but uh, now that I know in the communities, others use this very device, we'll have to figure something out. This One, is all because at work, um, we're starting to go into this agile workspace mode and the one thing I picked up from this meeting was carry your own keyboard, carry your own mice. And I'm, you know, so I've got a, uh, my, my trusty Keytron keyboard too, that I'm going to be lugging around and find a case for that. If you, if you decided to start printing stuff, I mean, I, I have, you know, obviously a PLA printer, but uh, I'm have most of the folks that I know now are going to resin. Okay. So, you know, so that just, just take a look at uh, the resin, the resin printing once the, as these patents drop out, the, the reason PLA became super available was because the patent ended. Same thing with resin. Now that resin, the patent ended a couple of years ago and now the prices have dropped from thousands of dollars to low hundreds. <laughs> like you can get a resin printer on Amazon for like $350. And um, some of the stuff that on another forum that I'm on of a bunch of 3D folks, what they're building with the resin printers is just insane. In small New York City apartments. So I don't know, that'd be kind of, yeah, I don't there have the workspace. Yeah, okay, yeah, we'll, okay, we'll okay. Talk. We'll talk. yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have to, you just have to make it bigger. It, 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 it doesn't have to be a huge volume. It just has to be bigger than your mouse. It has to be able to print bigger than your mouse. So. The ventilation could be a, a factor. Uh, Courtney, you want to weigh in? I don't understand what the problem is. How delicate is this mouse trackball for, for shipping? And why don't you just use something like a, you know, if you look on Amazon for a makeup case or something, a zippered vinyl case like this would fit over it and it's padded. Uh, you know, that might be a great way to pack your little oh, accessories you into for about 11 bucks and yeah, no but, printer required. But yeah, keep your that makeup out of require, the data. There's no pre-printing if you know, do go that there's no, there's no geekery there. <laughs> yeah, <hey, laughs> you came to the wrong place. Look at go to 11. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, let's go to our next question. <laughs> no geekery, I'm sorry. I have to recover from that. Okay, Douglas Carmichael is here to ask a question. Alex, you mentioned team relatability as a major factor in determining who to hire. What techniques are useful for smoothing cultural gaps and misunderstandings within professional relationships? Nigel? Yes, yeah, so I'm just listening to the Joe Torrey book about his Yankee years. And what strikes me about the book is that for those that follow baseball, there were years when the Yankees in the late... Uh, last century, the beginning of this century, were almost untouchable. What it was was a group of people all working for a common mission that didn't care about their individual stats or what mattered to them. They understood the objective of the team and they drove towards the objective of the team. Um, then what happens is they all leave and they hire nothing but superstars who care about themselves and their appearance and, and what it looks like to them. And the team is not successful. I think that the key thing in this space, at least for me, is having a common view of where you're all going. If people understand where you're all going, they can all get there. Nice points. And because John. I agree with Nigel 100%. The most important thing is having a shared mission and understanding your place in that mission and what your role is to, to solve it. When there are conflicts, I think basic empathy is 
probably the most important skill to develop. Uh, one model I like for that is called the Situation Behavior Impact Intention Model. And the idea there is in a given situation, we see our own behaviors and our own intentions, uh, but we see other people's behaviors and their impact on us. So we don't see our own impact and we don't see the other person's intention. We end up judging ourselves by our intentions and we judge other people by the impact they have on us. And so learning how to separate yourself from your response so that you can talk to a person and explain how their behavior impacted you in a non-judgmental way is one thing you can do to help resolve conflict. Uh, a couple decent books on the topic are one called Crucial Conversations and another one called Radical Candor. Is that kind of how, like how in a video conferencing thing like Zoom, we can't hear our own audio, we can't see our own video until it's played back to us? Let's go to our next question. Uh, sorry, Dave. I, thought. I was going to add to what both Nigel and John are saying, and in, in my experience working with people who are being disruptive or non-professional, I often had to take them aside and ask them how they're feeling and just deal with them as a person and take it out of the context of this challenge they're against. And then, like Nigel said, if we can reframe what's going on to separate that from the purpose of what all the team are doing and that you're pulling the rest of the team back by imposing your emotions onto the situation and whatever conflict it is can be resolved later, then often I find I get cooperation, they park it for a while, and then we deal with it after the project. Nice thoughts. And Alex? I mean, I've worked with teams all over the world and uh, I find that people that are great on teams, it, it's, it transcends culture. <laughs> like, so it, it doesn't, it's not really, people who are good team members are, you know, they, again, some of the stuff that was mentioned before, they care about the overall project, they get themselves out of the way, they want to learn, they want to do better than what they were doing, you know, everybody wants to be better every single time. And and that seems to be something that in any country that I'm in, I, I find that to be the case, the, the folks that are generally the hardest to to work with are the ones that have the most experience. So, um, you know, you know, it was, uh, you know, I, you know, that's the hardest part that you have to deal with. And that's, so the hardest people to find are people that are highly experienced that are still, um, you know, what, what my, my uncle used to call ha haven't suffered from hardening of the opinions yet. And so the, um, and so the, uh, and so that's the thing that, that has to, that you have the most trouble with is you have, whether they're camera operators or TDs or directors or whatever, they have their way. This is the way I do it. And I'm not going to do it any other way. And I'm not really going to listen to you. And, you know, and so, so those are the things that are hard to, to work with, but as, that's why I spend most of my time working with folks that are learning. Um, and I want to, I want to work with them while they're still, while their, their opinions are still soft. And it allows us to kind of build teams that, that are much more, um, uh, they're, they're much more congruent when you start with folks that aren't, when the team building begins, when they're not as formed, you know, and then, and it allows them to kind of form together, you know, over time. Um, and it, it, it generally builds better teams. It's great to have folks that have good experience. What, what you want to do is, is highlight in specific areas, people who are that spongy learning everything and great on teams, you find those people in their gold. It's why, like when I do an a live event, the f there are first people I call. <laughs> you know, there's there's you know Nate Hill who who uh, you know that you've you, a lot of you have met Brent by Nate Hill on my TD Brent by on my on my uh, camera. Um, if it's if it's more musical oriented, Marcia uh, um, that who a lot of you've heard calls call shows. Um, Brian Maddox, you know when I'm doing live events, these are the people that if I get one or two of them in a team, I know that everything's gonna work. <laughs> like, you know, everything's going to work. Everything's going to turn out because they will fix almost everything else just by being there. And man, when I get every once in a while, I'm lucky I get all of them in one, in one room. And then I just, I don't have to do anything like this is going to be really, really relaxing show for me um, because I just have, you know, but they're, they are learning every day. You, t you, you work with them. Those are, they're highly experienced. Some of the most experienced people I've ever worked with. And they are constantly looking for the new thing and constantly trying to figure it out. And you just got to keep looking for people like that. And fortunately with production, most of the time we're not hiring people. We're just high, we're just doing gig work. And so you just keep sorting until you find them. Got our next question. David Brady, New York, New York, Proto Hologram Epic. Could this be a game changer in our post pandemic world? We'll cover this briefly. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, the 
uh, was at the same show that David Brady and I were actually at at Infocom. There was one and it was definitely attracting a, a lot of attention. It was interesting to look at. Um, I shot a, a little bit of video. So the gentleman here uh, on the white screen is in front of a Sony a7 III. There's a ATEM uh, mini back behind here, but here's what it looks like when I walked up to it. So that's the screen right there. And again, he's just a few feet away right there. So he's over here live and then he's in the box. And we can see him moving around. And then there's the output. And then he gives me a virtu a high five. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. It's, pre it's pretty cool to see, you know, that's like a basically a TV turned sideways, uh, but it's just HD resolution. They, they weren't even using the extra, an, an, an A10 4K. And uh, it, it looked good, felt good. It, you wouldn't believe how many people lined up to, to get in front of this thing. So the camera was down down over there. It's just an A7 III. But I could see this uh, for people across the country, one in New York, one in San Francisco, talking on a stage. It, it actually, life-size, when you the person's that big, you know, six feet, five feet, whatever, it, it's pretty impressive. So something to take a look at. Nice. And quickly, Courtney? Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, it was using the Pepper's Ghost with a white box behind it, so it's got a piece of reflective glass in the middle that's reflecting a a 4K vertically oriented LED screen. Or I, I noticed they used it on the. I saw it first on the Howie Mandel uh, does things podcast. Here's what it, he was bringing David Nussbaum, who was one of the inventors, into the scene. There, they're interviewing Mike Judge, and. Uh, it looked pretty realistic because there in the room, he's life size and uh, his eye line. If you arrange the eye line, notice he's looking at Mike there, you know, so they look at each other and it is a touch screen. So uh, it's interesting to do in an interview show like that one where you can bring guests in and their life size and full standing. But uh, I wasn't sure the technology used, but maybe a guy can tell us if it uh, was a 45 degree mirror so that as you move from one side to the other the box the white box that's in the background changes perspective but the person really doesn't because they're on a white seamless their image is on a white seamless that kind of melds into the background box i'm not sure how they achieve the is that a video representation axis. guy so i went inside the box and i can't tell you what's inside the box <laughs> nice uh david What's in, What's the, box? in the box? <laughs> exactly. No, um, I missed that at Infocom, guys. So I appreciate you doing the digging. I have a friend who's working there. So if there's any interest, I could always put something in the pipeline. They, and they have a a smaller device, too, that's like a tabletop one that you can leave at grandma's house, I guess, or something like that. Um, it looks pretty cool. I'm interested to see it. And I think they have offices in Van Nuys and here in New York. So I'm trying to drum up interest in my team at work to go visit. And Alex, real quick. Uh, yeah, so, and this has been around for a little while. There's um, there's a spaces uh, group, if you, um, I don't have a picture, here's the funny thing, I don't have a picture of this because I was working on another event in the same building, um, but the uh, but this is the, this was done, um, we did, we, we worked on this a couple, couple years ago. And um, so those were, the, each one of those people were in some other part of the world in a shipping container. Um, and so there's a shipping container that was all set up. Um, and so in this case, we had the cameras are just above um, where they're looking. And in some cases, in some of the shipping containers, they put them behind the projection. Um, I think I, I actually might have pictures of that one from, uh, I, I visited one of them in Iraq, um, but but the, uh, they're, this company, and I just, I'm just trying to think of the official name of the company, um, has these all over the world. And so you can actually, um, in a lot of places, they're in conflict zones or in areas that are more challenged. So that when you go to, a, they, they do these, um, you see them at World Economic Forum, um, at, uh, you know, other events where you really try to connect people to the world. I thought that it was a bunch of hoo-ha when I, when people said that it was, when people were excited about it. But when you stand up in front of four, four people and you realize you're looking live to, people in four different parts of the world. It's, it's pretty impressive. So. Yeah. yeah very neat. And our uh, guy, you want to finish us up? Yeah. There's another one by Google that somebody had brought up in a question. They call it Starline. And I put a link in the chat. This one seems to be more AI, but it is pretty freaky as to what the future is going to bring. Uh, you guys, can, I don't want to show the the link. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, got a bunch of stuff, but anyways, we, we saw it. If you remember Alex, it's the one where the lady had the, uh, the, 
the hair that was uh looking like a 3d model actually i guess oh I yeah show it yeah, yeah anyways the link's in the chat you guys can take a look at it fantastic well thank you everyone uh, all of our panelists all of our producers for our first hour of saturday uh that concludes our first hour but stay tuned um we have our education hour coming up next we're going to do a brief change where we'll swap out our panel and then dave will come back with distance education dave uh, what are you going to be talking about today well coming coming next we'll be looking at the history of distance learning as well as discuss what kind of future it has going forward. We'll also be taking questions and sharing our impressions about where the latest technologies for online instruction might be taking it. Uh, stay with us through the little break while we prepare a program and settle our panelists in their chairs. Education Hour starts in just a little while. There's the bicycle for your brain. I asked mid-journey degree. Briefs need to be changed. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Was, was that what you're thinking when you got by? That's what it was. Brain? Yeah. Good seeing y'all. I'll be back next weekend. Thanks, Brady. David. Brady. That's okay. <laughs> thanks for coming. It's great to have you. Right on. Thanks. Yeah. It's hard to get a label for Brady. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like that background. That's, that's CBS, though. So don't use it. I'm not going to use it, but it's pretty. <laughs> They obviously spent more money on it than we did. <laughs> they spent all the money. Yeah. All right, that was great, Gus. All right, Sam. Welcome, educators. I believe we the lobby is empty, so we have our full complement of educators. Is that correct? Yes, I believe it is. And John Snyder, I believe you're showing black to the back team that gets their dander off. And 
one thing we can do is use actually a virtual background it makes a nice stand in if you don't have OBS or a switcher. I will do that in the future. Sorry about that back end. I thought I thought black was appropriate as long as you left your camera on. So I will. Stand uh, yeah, so they can't tell the difference between a black screen and one that's having an issue. Yeah, can't, turning the camera off will lose you in the pins. Sending black means they don't know if there's a problem with the signal you're sending into Zoom. Copy that. No worries. I, I just had that uh, workaround. Someone uh, showed it to where they just used their virtual background, just walked out of the frame, and then their virtual background stayed up as the, the image they were sending to Zoom. I don't yet have a picture of my background. <laughs> so I have my old background, which I could use, but it's less convincing as a ghost when you fade into a different picture. Right. And uh, Chris and Brian, I don't believe you guys have spoken yet. Do we have aud good audio from you? I'm told that my audio is perfect today, but. Very good. And Brian, just so that we get your. Uh... Hello. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Fantastic. Thanks for coming. Break a leg, Dave. Thanks for joining us. If you visit officehours.global, you can find a link to our Mukana where you can ask your questions. Today's subject is distance learning, which of course is also distance teaching. So we're going to try and deal with both sides of that. But it's a highly technological discussion. It's a, it's a subject about the way we deploy technology in service of teaching and solving problems of distance. Um, I first came up across the idea of distance learning while working with a group of support staff in the university. And uh, they were learning how to apply new interactive technologies to their teaching. And one of the areas where we had a deep exploration was how to deliver a full curriculum to students in remote areas. From there, I learned how Australia and Canada both had a history of attempting to deliver schooling by radio. <laughs> schooling by television, satellite television, and in ways which would support learning at a distance. And in Canada, they called these correspondence courses when I was growing up, and eventually a whole correspondence university was developed. Uh, Athabasca University focused on this kind of distance learning management and trying to support the process. Then there were some uh, things done in Australia. Um, there was a widely distributed University of the Air, and Australia started with radio classes uh, back in the 60s. And it was a case of sending a radio out to a remote area where two or three children would have a daily experience of a teacher speaking to them on the radio, tasking them with things to look into or stuff to read and materials that were sent to them would support the cur curriculum. And you can imagine with, with a radio class that the audio quality could vary depending on the reception quality and the speaker and the kind of radio it was. And as well, of course, at the teacher end of things, what was the burden to work with microphones, operate in maybe a, a radio studio with no students to look at, that sort of thing. So. It was a nice experiment and it went along for quite a long while, actually. Uh, Radio of the Air became uh, um, School of the Air. And um, it's actually even running today in, in remote areas of Australia. And in Canada, we, we have a different approach to this, uh, which in my province, Alberta, in the 90s, the uh, province kind of looked forward and said, if we're going to do this, we have to lay out some money. So about $800 million was set aside for the construction and installation of a province-wide fiber data network. And this was reaching every single municipality in the whole place. This is hundreds of places. And it wired up every town's, either the library or a civic center, uh, a meeting place where people could go, a public meeting place. 
And then it was up to that municipality to leverage the connection that they had. Um, it was finished in 2008, and it was always my thought that the killer app for this would be bingo, but turned out it became very useful for uh, telehealth medicine, uh, justice and law, people appearing in court from a distance. And my involvement was through children's services and, and helping parents deal with the bureaucracy of children's services at a distance and for the staff and management layer to be able to communicate with each other over these great distances and hold meetings by the hundreds uh, without actually having to leave their office. And as well, there was education and education leveraged this right from the beginning. Uh, at the university I was at, they installed quite a few teleconference centers uh, in each of the faculties. And it became my job and another person's job to go around and teach people how to use the Crestrons and how to make things work and make sure the room was lit properly and that sort of stuff. And uh, it was, um, the SuperNet is in operation right now and it's helping patients in remote communities, court appearances from distant regions, and people don't have to leave a correctional uh, facility anymore to appear in court. So this is helping in covering costs. It was estimated in our department, we saved six and a half million dollars a year in travel costs. Uh, every time we held one of these video meetings uh, with the deputy minister. Uh, today, I've noticed there's a lot of open colleges, they call them now, across the world, providing all these similar services, mostly at the higher levels of learning, uh, where it's more formalized and less responsive to, you know, the squirmy kids. Uh, but since about 2020, um, we have learning from home as a result of COVID. And this just sort of cracked open a new door to distance education. Certainly, we were trying to put teachers in the position of having to try and teach their classes to kids who are at home, and the distance wasn't much more than a half a mile or whatever. And it seemed innocuous for these people to be at home, but of course, with the pandemic, it meant nobody could assemble at school. And so the first thing they did was say, what do we use for distance learning? And put teachers in front of cameras on their laptops, gave students laptops and uh, Google Chromebooks, and then they could attend class from their kitchen, from the I, I, my neighbor did it from their deck. Um, it's the kind of thing that sort of pushes something over a hump where the resistance was um, cost-wise, technology-wise, and now it's simplified. It's brought down to just operating with laptops and doing things through Wi-Fi and internet. So let's start with what other people might have as an experience of uh, distance learning. And we'll go through a whole bunch of stuff like what was it like and what were some obvious drawbacks and what was more work. But I'm going to go to the questions and uh, begin with, um, um, I think uh, John is reading my questions today. I think we have some hands up, Dave. And Oh, okay. Uh, we'll put Brian up first then. Go ahead, Brian. Hey, going. So, um, so just uh, if you're not aware, I'm um, I'm a high school teacher originally, uh, teaching visual arts in Australia, and uh, been teaching for twenty years there. And then I'm currently now actually, um, I'm currently a online teaching instructor where I actually teach teachers via online learning. And so our delivery method is via Teams, where we get teachers to come together um, once a term, so once every sort of three months, and we actually are teaching them skills to improve and integrate strategies um, into their own subjects, and that will eventually, of course, improve students' learning as well. So this, uh, this is a unique delivery method that actually came out of COVID, but um, we've kept it going since. Thanks, that's great. And and I know some of what you're talking about because I had to show so many people how to use these giant, you know, systems with their PTZ cameras and stuff, but I've never had to actually teach someone to use the laptop to do teaching with yet. Uh, Chris. Thank you. Um, 
my experience with um, distance learning and distance teaching uh, started when I, back in my days at Michigan State, where I had a friend who was a professor at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. And their model, of course, is spread out. Uh, their customers are spread out all over a very large state, uh, similar to the Alaska situation, I think. <clears throat> and their their pattern was for the instructor to travel, to fly into each village that had a student or two in one of these college courses and uh, stay overnight with them. You know, bush, pl bush pilots were involved. Um, and then the instructor would link up with other students in the course via telephone. So one of the students, or maybe more than one, would be in person with the instructor sitting around a, a conference call type phone. And then other, other students around the, around the state would be tuning in via telephone link themselves. And then I was invited from Michigan to join one of these telephone networks and be a guest speaker, so to speak. And I thought that was a kind of a marvelous adaptation to the circumstances that the geographic circumstances and economic circumstances that those students uh, experienced. And, and it was a rather heroic uh, operation for the instructors. When you sign up for a course, you don't expect to be uh, flying all around a very large area, uh, but but they did it and uh, it was the Alaska way. Now, at the other end of the, the other extreme, um, I've been involved here at uh, Arizona State University in uh, teaching an online course um, that was all uh, co-designed with uh, a team of course designers who have really figured out how how to make the learning management system work effectively with the content design and the assignments and the submission and so forth and so on. Um, so it is a very impressive and elaborate system that no individual instructor could probably have set up for herself or himself, but as partnership between a faculty member expert in the content and mm -hmm. and technology experts or course design experts familiar with uh, best practices there and and uh, technological media um it turns out a pretty impressive set of courses um so uh i i think also the shift driven by uh by covid um the sudden shift, the pivot to online teaching and learning uh, involved some stumbles, of course. And uh, part of the stumble was, in my opinion, trying to replicate the, uh, the pace and content of the face-to-face -face courses that you had been teaching last week, to, to do the same schedule and the same length of time and the same assignments and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, isn't a good idea. <laughs> it, they don't fit into the, into the new box. Other things are possible. Greater things are possible in the, in the new con under the new constraints. But what doesn't work is to try to plug in exactly what you were doing face to face into a medium that has many different constraints and opportunities. I'll stop there. Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, John. My distance learning uh, experience started as a student and my undergrad and my first attempt at grad programs. I had several distance classes. One was correspondence that was asynchronous and it was totally self-directed. I read a book, sent in letters and papers uh, via email. And then I had a synchronous class that was um, over dial up Internet. So it was fast enough to do chats with each other uh, instead of having any audio visual and we had a cohort and it was really interesting and I learned quite a bit. 
I started a graduate program uh, with distance learning, but at the time, accreditation bodies didn't approve of full distance learning um, degrees. And so I finished a third of my degree that I was allowed to do, and I didn't feel like moving to finish my degree, so I just dropped it. Um, now, almost 15 years later, I'm wrapping up a different grad degree that I did completely all online. Um, and then as a trainer, um, we were doing all of our instruction was in person on site with uh, a classroom setting with several PCs all in the same room, teaching people how to take calls in a call center. And with COVID hitting, um, we had about 48 hours to get everyone uh, to be work from home. And from then on, I had to figure out how to train people virtually. So as a, an instructor, I was learning how to train virtually while I was trying to figure out the technology to do that, while we were trying to staff up for a COVID pandemic. Um, and now, two years after that, 80% of our workforce is work from home. And uh, because of that, most of our training is now virtual. So it was a, a complete switch from 15 years of transitioning slowly to distance learning to two days, and suddenly I was virtual. That's quite a load to take on just in a short period of time to both learn how to do it, set it up to so it works well, and then have people at the other end accept it. I, I, I remember hearing that MIT was putting all their courses online. They were going to be uh, offering them for free to anybody who wanted to audit any of their courses, and a slow process of converting each one to an online forum. And this is long before COVID was even a dream. Well, maybe not a dream. They were dreaming about it. But it was a, an offering to people who wanted to do things uh, in a virtual setting. I've never actually participated as you have in a course or had any accredited courses attributed to me. But I've heard and read quite a bit about it since then. And, and I get the sense that it's, it's now past the doorway and the door shut behind us. We can go through this now and have, offer it as a second thing rather than always wanting to have face-to-face -face in the classroom. Alex? Yes, I've experimented this for a little while. I, I have to admit that the lens that I sit through is that as someone who doesn't have a piece of paper that proves that I ever got any education ever, all the way back to high school, um, I don't, uh, I don't care about accreditation. Like, so I, so I'm, you know, so I, I don't care. All I care about is making people operational. And so how quickly can I get them to a point where they can do the thing that they need to do? So it comes from that lens, because I think that when you add accreditation, when you add having to test people and figure all that stuff out, which to me is sur sur super, Superfluous. Superfluous. Yes. I, I don't need. I don't need. I can't even say the word. So anyway. So yeah, the. Um, uh, so, so anyway. Uh, but I. So I, I. don't think about it that way. So I, I. have to say that the comments that I have are are inside of the lens of I am a workforce development person. Like that's I am trying to get people to a point where they can work. You know, and so not not that they have some piece of paper or that they have something else that it doesn't matter to me. So mm -hmm. in that through that lens. With PixelCore, we really started with this idea of I'm going to give you a bunch of videos, then I'm going to give you a bunch of challenges, and then it was also asymmetrical, not because we wanted to do it asymmetrically. We desperately wanted to do symmetrical discussion. We couldn't because we couldn't afford it. <laughs> like it was really expensive 20 years ago to have video. So so we couldn't afford to do that. So what we did is we had a V bulletin. Uh, we had challenges. And one of the things that we got very good at and one of the things we found very important for distant learning is peer-to-peer -peer education, which is... And you see us doing this here all the time. We don't want it to be a person that knows how to do it. And constantly what we're trying to do is inject knowledge into a, into a persistent organization that can continue to train each other. Um, and so by creating a, a, a community, not a I'm going to go take this course for two weeks or, or a year, but I'm going to think about how I do this for the next decade with this, organ, with this group of people. At that point, you can start injecting knowledge into it. So having people come to our second hours during the week, having us have these discussions, not everybody has to be part of those discussions to benefit from those. Because if you go to Discord or if you go to other things, now there's a lot of other people that can answer that question. It's not just one person. And so a lot of it was figuring that out. Um, many of the things that we did, though, were challenges. And the idea was how do we keep those challenges to be very specific? So one of the things that I had a discussion uh, with John Foster, who's passed uh, recently, but... I, I told John that I could teach people how to do 3D by having them do a series of cubes, just cubes. All you got to do is build a cube, a cement cube, an ice cube, a fleshy cube, <laughs> a leather cube, you know, like all these, like, like just different cubes. And you'll learn everything you need to know about modeling and surfacing and everything else inside of this. So we started doing those with our, 
with our members and they learned a lot, you know, um, and, and because they were trading notes, they were sitting there. So the idea was constantly to throw something into the system, provide expert knowledge, and then allow them to, to learn. Um, as we built um, in Rwanda, we built this. This is this was uh, this is probably eight years ago. Um, so this is me teaching Cinema 4D in Rwanda from my house in Petaluma, California. And um, and so the way we did this again is a video. Um, it's a I sent them a video of how to do something. I gave them a challenge to go do it. We then came back and discussed their questions. So I either expected a result or questions. Like they had to you had to and, and in other countries it's very hard because culturally they don't want to ask questions. And so I the, the their assignment was come back with a finished product that is as good as mine or come back with questions or you will fail. <laughs> like, you know, like, are we gonna, you know, like, like you need to, you need to do one or the other. It didn't matter which one. It just had to, you, had to, you know, keep the conversation moving. So mm -hmm. in this case, I'm projecting, you know, this is actually where this, this Telestrator began was, was this, um, was solving this classroom problem. And on one screen, it was actually go to meeting because it was, it had the best solution there. And then Hangouts was the, uh, was the other, or, you know, was the other, was the video solution. Now the advantage here is the classroom has, because it's a media school, I had a three camera shoot in the classroom. So I was getting good video feedback from the class as well. But yeah. those things really started to pop my eyes open because as I started doing that, the big thing is, is that we started being able to bring in other experts. Nick Jushishin, who you've talked to before, did a class on photogrammetry. Uh, Carolyn Stamping did one on Photoshop, but they didn't, the instructors, didn't need to go to Rwanda. <laughs> like they, 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 they only needed to turn on their computer one for an hour or two a week and be connected as opposed to a 30 hour flight and, you know, and, and travel and getting everything, you know, and, and being there. It was, and, and that's when I really got one of the times when I really was like, this is the, this is the future of education because now I can have the perfect person speak to everyone at one time, as opposed to someone who's doing the best they can. You know, like, you know, and, and, and that's the, you know, for, for that region or for that 15 students. And that seemed as the, as my, as my mind got around that, it seemed horribly inefficient <laughs> to, to not have like, you know, we could have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining physics if we, if, you know, if we, if we made the, the group that he was talking to large enough. Yeah. Yeah. Some time ago, I did a little talk to some people in education, the faculty of education about how it might work to have a sort of celebrity professor, someone who's the world's expert in something. And our university had about 15 of these people. They were top in the world. Everyone recognized their work. And the thought was that if you gave them video live and had them sort of teach to a class, but teach to a class with video augmenting it, uh, they could enroll 100,000 students and it would be completely paid for. And the part that I explained to all these people is the only thing preventing us from doing that in a future where bandwidth is not a problem uh, is the support people behind the scenes. You've got to give a whole team of people access to that professor and then bring those people from outside the lecture hall or the classroom into the discussion with their questions and their stuff. Well, and everybody turned to me and said, well, Dave, this isn't doable. You can't just make one guy, the whole university and the whole faculty. And I said, well, yeah, that's OK. But it is more important about the infrastructure supporting this. And now we've come that far in the 15 years since I did that, that the bandwidth is there. The technology that people have in their homes is there. The cameras are ubiquitous now. And the potential for 100,000 students to sign into a course is now available. You're, you're absolutely correct, though, that the ratio, when you increase that ratio, the teacher to student ratio, you're not increasing it one to like, if you say, I'm going to have one teacher for every 2000 students, you still need a whole bunch of infrastructure of people. There's another 20 or 30 people that make that work that so that lowers your ratio ratio down. It's just a different kind of people. One of the things we learned with DV garage training was you don't want the experts to have to do anything other than be experts. So unless they're a media, even if they're a media expert, even for me, you need somebody, you need a group of people that, that they're going to talk to and say, I need this, I want this, I want this, whatever. And they go out and, and, ex, and, and do that because even the expert who knows how to do it can't do it all the time, can't do it, mm -hmm. can't get all that stuff done in a lifetime. And so and so what, what you need to do is build kind of a hierarchy. And so what we did is we took experts that knew photogrammetry or 3D or Photoshop 
we just had them come in and dump their information to us. You know, just let's get it out. And this is how Masterclass really started. If you look at the early Masterclasses, they just got, you know, people to come in and just talk for a while and turn mm -hmm. it into a show. You know, they paid them a lot of yes. money to, you know, David to Mamet comes in and talks about it, but he's just riffing. Like he's just talking about method. his ideas. Yeah. He didn't, there was no structure. Yeah. Um, they slowly figured it, found their way to it. But that's what they're doing is they're taking someone who's really good at bread or really good at music or really good at acting and they take all of the complexity away from that expert so that they can do the thing that they do. Like yeah. if you look at a simple master yeah. class, they shoot some of those close to where, mm -hmm. I, where I work. And, um, and, you know, it's 50 people in a studio with a four wall built into a massive stage um, to make that actually work. But that's affordable because they multiply it by all the viewers. And so to your point, when you have 100,000 people, and the other thing though is that when we have experts, the thing we really learned is stop having them lecture. Stop. Mm -hmm. Just stop. Stop having them lecture. If they want to do a lecture, have them record a video and let everyone watch it. Those who want to watch the video can go watch the video. But what mm -hmm. is what, what's important when we have this valuable moment with them is Q&A. We just want to ask them questions because, because they're going to they're gonna riff, but give them the content that they wanted to give, but produce that really nicely and release it a week early because that's going to make all the questions better. And what the other thing we found is that in distance learning, not everybody has to watch the video. If 10 to 15 percent of your view of your student body watches the video, the conversation becomes so rich that most of the most of the people who didn't watch the video will benefit almost equally to the people who watch the video. It's great. It's a crazy. It's crazy math. It is. Next question. John Fultz in Sellins Grove, Pennsylvania says, during COVID, many weren't ready for online. They didn't understand tech, didn't want to learn and yearned for face-to-face. -face. They had horrible results. And now they say, we tried online and it just doesn't work. I hear that all the time. It just doesn't work. I can't do my job. It's too much of an overburden on me to prepare for these people who are coming in on Zoom. Yeah, it's, it's a constant complaint. But I think it's like most other things, you know, the car was too dangerous and then they made it safer. The airplane was too risky and then they made it safer. So I think in a media sense, we're getting comfortable with this media in other contexts and then bring education toward those contexts. Um, we can start with Chris. Thank you. Um, I think everything that John Fultz says is true of a lot of um, teachers and learners, for that matter, students. Um, I think that also that um, the secret, if there is a secret of um, making a continuous improvement in the ways in which we use these technologies is practice. And um, Office hours is a good example of having uh, met every morning for 850 mornings. Um, we've all gotten much better than 900 some, yes. 900, <laughs> yeah. Uh, time flies when you're having fun with, with smart people. But those smart people two years ago uh, were a lot clunkier in their interaction and their use of the technology and its possibilities and and their development of uh, ways of uh, speaking and, and turn taking and and responding to questions and so forth and it's become uh, much more a, a smooth and uh, realizing the potential of of distance uh, interaction and conversation than it was two years ago and I put much of that down to uh, practice and kind of affirmative doubt that we're going into this uh, not, not immediately rewarded with a transformative experience immediately, but uh, in the optimism that it will get better. We're gonna get better at this, we're gonna get better at this. And, and we did. Yes. Um, and the final point, I, I made earlier um, is that um, I think a lot of attempts to uh, pivot immediately to uh, virtual learning during COVID quarantine was uh, misguided in the sense that um, 
educators tried to replicate what they had been doing in face-to-face -face schooling, and it doesn't mm -hmm. fit. The content and the schedule and the, the demands of homework and so forth that kind of worked in the face-to-face -face world don't fit neatly into um, the virtual world. Other things are possible that are better and deeper, but um, if you try to jam a square peg into a round hole, it, you're not going to have good results. So that was a big lesson I took from, from the dissatisfaction yeah. with the, the rapid pivot. And some of the wonder that I felt with office hours is the number of volunteers in the background making it happen. Um, there's a rotating group of dedicated individuals making this happen. And it's quite amazing that it's demonstrating that same learning capacity. These people are learning how to run a TV show at the same time as learning how to be on a panel or learning how to, I'm learning how to host a show. I've never had to do it before. And all of that is by practice, as, as uh, Alex said earlier, simply by doing, we are learning more about how it works and how it doesn't. And then the iterations make it more smooth. And yeah, you're right about the early days. All the cameras were not so great. The lighting was not so great. That happened in all the schools as well. That nobody staged it properly. They tried to give teachers a walk around space and it got really crazy after a while. Uh, we can go to Alex now. I mean, you had a, a bunch of... Uh a bunch of administrators that were resisting the whole thing, a bunch of uh, teachers that were resisting it. There were literally conversations that I was in that they didn't want it to be successful because if it got successful, it would basically undermine their entire, the entire business model of a public school. And so there was that's definitely- most some, disruption does, doesn't it? It's well, they, just, and they get, so there was, it there was some resistance. serious concerns inside of the school system that if we, if we invest too much in this and it actually is too successful, it creates a whole new set of problems because they get paid by students being in the building. They don't get paid by students being out of the building. They didn't have a business model for that, you know? And so that, you know, they didn't, how do you figure out what school gets what money if the kids are virtual? Does the virtual system get all that money and then the student then the then the brick and mortar doesn't get that money, so those are those were you have to understand that they weren't trying very hard, <laughs> like, you know, to make this work, um, and and so you know I think that that they were weren't trying very hard. They were didn't know anything about what they were doing. They took all that money and it, and they were literally I was talking to someone about this. It, they were not allowed to use much of the money that was given to them. I, I I was asking somebody like why didn't you spend all this money on technology? A lot of the grant money from the government was not allowed to be earmarked as technology. You know, specifically, it was, you could do a lot of other things with it, you couldn't invest in that thing, you know? Um, and so, and so the, um, and so that there was a lot of things that held it back, but the reality is, is that it's the future. Um, if, if you look at what happened with Arizona, Arizona's got probably the most aggressive um, voucher system, just got real, I think in the last week or two was, was passed, uh, $7,000 a student, $7,000 $7, as a student, is the end of brick and mortar. Like just, just see, like, just so we, like so everyone hears what that, what that sounds like, because, it, because I, and I think this is unfortunate and it's why we were trying to so hard to work with public schools is because what I want is a, is the ability to build distributed or decentralized schools at $14,000 a student or at $12,000 a student and make them epically great. But we have to understand that a lot of online schools are already running at 2,500 you know, um, dollars a student, 7,000 is an enormous amount of money for an online um, school. And they're yeah. going to, it's, it is a, uh, it's an invasive species, invasive species. You know, like it's, it's going to like, there's no way, there's no way for brick and mortar to compete if, if students are given 7,000. And so the public schools really have to pivot. They have to look at how they're going to take the money that they have now and and I admit that I've had this conversation. I had this conversation with TV, radio, and and print in two thousand between two thousand and two thousand two. Take where you take your current position and leverage it into the future. And none of them did, you know. Um, and wow. um, literally, the ones in print, I always talk about this because they always they laughed at me. <laughs> the, the crowd laughed at me while I was on stage. Mm -hmm. I, I've never been laughed at before while, when I wasn't telling a joke. And um, so, so I, that's why I rub it in because I was like, what did I tell them? It was like 200 publishers, you know? And, and the thing is, is that uh, what public schools have to do is leverage their, their current position and their current funding to build online distributed and, and, you know, and flexible schools. If they don't, they won't exist in 10 years. 
Like it is mm -hmm. like, it, you know, because as soon as the students really love the things that are in Arizona, there's going to be a bunch of articles and there's going to be a bunch of political pressure. You know, parents don't care about, parents like the to talk about the caring about politics. Walls they don't. Of the classroom. All they care about is their kids. And if they think that they're, and, and, you know, if they think their kids can get a better education somewhere else, you know, I, you know, people move to be around schools that get high ratings, you know, like, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, the, the, the public, this is a really critical time for public school systems. I don't know if they can make the turn, um, from the conversations I've had, cause man, have I tried. <laughs> so, but, but I, yeah. but they, but they do need to make the turn in the next five years or they're done. In our, uh, jurisdiction here, just in the city of Edmonton, we have what's called school-based budgeting. So the school gets budgets based on how many students choose to go to that school. Right, that's and, like that everywhere. Yeah, and and that kind of thing is gonna make the smart administrators leverage that income to make it a more virtual experience and build infrastructure that supports students. And they can claim to be going to any school in the city, uh, and I've sent my son to faraway schools because of what we wanted from that school. Yep. And if what people want from school is that the kid is learning in a better exchange environment, a sort of pro project approach, as I you know, have been promoting, uh, where the questions matter more than what the teacher's curriculum is, uh, then we're going to see more people trying it. The hard part is, is this whole regional idea that we're going to give money to a specific school because a student is attached to it is holding all the school systems back because it just has to be a bigger, like there's this many people in the school system and we're going to distribute it in a way that makes sense because the problem is, is that you don't really want to, you want the teachers to be able to free flow between the schools. The best physics teacher should be teaching all the students, not, you know, we shouldn't have to, you know, we should, anyway. No, that's true. That's that's to be worked out politically. Brian Shan. Yeah, so I think um, in some part, going back to the question of um, not being ready for online learning, that they weren't ready because they hadn't experienced it before. But um, in some schools, though, distance learning is actually something that happens all the time. And um, students who are seeking to, to look for, for other opportunities. Um, in fact, we've actually got a, a, a first private online school in Victoria um, that's emerging out of this. So there is, um, you know, there's a a real embrace of of the distance learning or the the online learning um, that gives students opportunities, especially if students are also in regional areas and and government schools provide this as well within Australia um, for students who they may not have the specialist teacher or the the number of students in the classes are too small and they need to seek other opportunities to to study those subjects. So having that variety and being prepared for that and being flexible for that, I think is important for the future. Mm -hmm. It also occurs to me that, you know, classroom management as a skill is going to have to change because they teach you how to operate classrooms in person and manage the attention uh, and the focus and the speed of delivery, but uh, on a, a larger scale or even on a distant scale, that's a whole new skill set that has to be acquired. John Snyder? Yeah, I would agree 100%. Online teaching is a different skill than in-person in -person teaching or instructor-led training. And what we did over the course of a couple of days was ask teachers who weren't taught how to do it well to do a different job. It's like asking a painter, handing them a couple of sculpting tools and say, go sculpt the statue David and see what kind of results you get. It's no surprise that the kids are the ones who suffered and education wasn't super successful. And by the time we finally got our feet under us, a couple semesters later, we all are now going back to in-person schools. And so really, I think the, the long-term solution is going to be to develop tools and structures to to ensure that teachers have the skill to teach in the situation that they find themselves, whether it's in distance or in classroom, they are different skill sets that should be used differently uh, for different situations. And um, hopefully we learn that lesson. I think actually the relief people are feeling about going back to the classrooms may be short lived, that there may have been aspects of the distance learning the kids I'm going to use kids because that was the, the high impact debate, uh, are going to have sayings like, well, it's boring now because I, I can switch modes when I'm at home, but now I've got to sit here and wait for other people to catch up. And in a sense, maybe even the student experience will push this process along 
if they found it more useful for them. But if they suffered along, as the question asks, if they all said, I hate this, I don't want to do this anymore, and now they want to be in the classroom, then we'll have to roll it over one more time, I guess, at the next round. Uh, Alex, you want to come back to it? Yeah, I mean, one thing we have to also underline is that the, the teachers weren't equipped. You know, they were just not given the tools that they need. I mean, if you look at, you know, again, if you'd taken a bunch of the money that they spent on plexiglass and spent it on teachers having, you know, really solid, uh, you know, being able to draw like that, they could, no te almost no teacher could do that, <laughs> like what I just did there. And um, being able to, you know, put those things together, putting those on their desk, I don't speak anymore at physical events even now. I just turn them all down unless I can come in remotely because my my setup, what I'm sitting in front of is way better than anything I'm gonna find in a conference center. And so I don't have any interest in having the conversation. I sound better, I look better, I have better content, I have better all the things that are there. I'm, you know, I, I'm already you know, ahead of that. So I think that, that we just didn't give the teachers the, the training, the support, or the equipment, and we constantly told them, well, this is only for this term and next term we're gonna go back. And so no one was investing in a long-term, you know, solution to make, make it actually work. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Chris, you wanna bring us home? Yes. Uh, one of the principles I sort of accidentally discovered and in face-to-face -face instruction was that the uh, important time for learning is between class meetings. It's not during the class meeting. And I don't think many teachers have made that shift to realizing that the real learning time is uh, after following the getting something started that happens either in a face-to-face -face meeting or in an online conversation. And I think that that is a seismic shift in the way that uh, teachers think about their role, because we've been brought up to think that prime time for learning is when we're listening to the expert or the authority expound on an idea. And it's actually not. It's that's I, what I say to my graduate students is the time we come together face to face, whether it's physically or virtually, is a time to uh, report on what you've done and thought and learned and run into since the last time we met and to make some plans for what you're going to do, try to do between this time and the next time we meet after this. So that's really the prime, the prime time. The, the idea is to get the learning out into the world into real realistic context rather than treating the the classroom time as uh, as the prime time for learning and that you're responsible for regurgitating on some kind of a test or term paper. Yeah, and some would say that was the mechanical model. Uh, it's what McLuhan uh, objected to. He thought the city was a classroom and not the classroom, and that the classroom was really just to teach people how to behave well in a factory. So. We have that turnover happening where we don't have factories anymore. What are we teaching them? Well, we got to teach them critical thinking more these days and pattern recognition than we than we do for listening to how to do um, well, how to understand geography and all the rest of it. But po uh, the power of just doing it between classes is where the learning is cemented in. Uh, next question, then. I myself in Reno, Nevada ask, what was your first aha moment when transitioning to virtual or distance education, whether gear, technique, or philosophical concept? Well, start off again with Chris. Back in 2006, um, I was involved with the first cohort of a new doctoral program that involved face-to-face um, -face meetings once a week. Uh, and also embedding the students' first action research study in their own workplace into the course. And the way we designed it, we met face-to-face -face for about five weeks and then sent our underprepared students out into their world, into their workplaces to do their very first action research study. And we decided not to have face-to-face -face meetings during the four weeks or so 
that they were to conduct these small studies, but that we would check in with each other um, once a week for an hour with smaller groups of these students, there were 25 or so students, um, virtually. We would have, I think we use Google meetings, um, what, Google groups or whatever it was called yeah, meet, at the meet time. Meet it's called, yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the big aha, to respond to John's question, was that uh, it actually works better to meet for less than an hour virtually than it worked to meet for three hours on a Thursday night face to face mm -hmm. and leave, leave the time and energy for the students to be actually trying to do something and to be able to report on what they were running into their successes and their frustrations sure. and for, and for each of their classmates to hear what's going on in this other school or this other workplace and, and be able to chime in and either, you know, it's a, an example of the peer to peer, uh, mutual support system, learning community, rather than the, uh, uh, burden and authority all being invested in the, uh, instructor mm -hmm. of record. So, sure. so that was, a, I think a better version oh, of, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It is a better version of a hybrid uh, instruction calendar than when you're trying to uh, speak to two different audiences at the same time. This was a sort of sequential hybridization where we were in person for part, all of us were in person for part of the time, then all of us were uh, com com participating virtually for part of the time. Yeah, right. Okay, thanks, John. I would say the biggest uh, technique that changed for me was realizing that when you're not constrained by location and time, you can design your learning to be more effective for your learner. And you can do that by um, recording content and making sure your videos or um, e-learning modules are top tier stuff that everyone needs, especially if they need to refer to it again in the future. It makes it easier for people to remember the most important and complicated things. And then you can use discussion to really incorporate the learning into that and make that long term retention. You can space learning out using space repetition. It really frees you up to make sure that your education stays in the person's brain longer. So you spend less time educating and the person remembers more of it as a result. Um, and then as far as gear goes, I think the biggest aha for me was the uh, ATEM Mini Pro, uh, which is a device that lets you switch between multiple inputs for a camera source. So you can have multiple computers or a camera and you can switch between them. You can record your own um, record uh, meetings and that sort of thing as well. It really makes a difference in how you come across to the learner in virtual uh, settings where you're all in the same meeting room. Yeah, pushing focus around to the things you're trying to show or demonstrate. Yeah, that's that's key to the whole thing there. Alex? I think for me, there were like two really big aha moments um, as I as I kind of worked through some of this. One was, I've talked about this in the past, so I'll make it really quick. I, I got double scheduled for an in-person classroom. And so I had to record videos for both classrooms so that they could watch a video and start working. And then I would go to the other classroom and answer questions. And I would just go back and forth. And it's the, it is, this is the seed of office hours is that I suddenly realized that, that they, um, that it didn't matter that I, I, presented at all, the movies were better than I was because they, they were movies of me, <laughs> so, so, but it was still better for the student because some of the students were watching, I know, to, uh, watching their behavior. Some of them are watching at 1.5x. They're just, they understand it. They're just running through what are the steps, what are the steps, what are the steps. The other ones were rewinding it over and over and over again. Now you can't do that in a lecture. You can't do that in real time. Can't get them to rewind uh, other than asking questions. And when you ask Could questions- Could you please repeat that? Yes. Yeah. So when you, when you ask them to do that, you've now slowed the entire class down, you know, and there's people like me that are like, oh my gosh, like just ask that later, you know, like, you know, and so, so the, um, so the, so it's embarrassing. It puts you in a, a different position, slows the, it slows the whole, the whole class to the lowest common denominator rather than letting them just watch it at their own speed and absorb it as needed um, and then discuss it. So what I did 
is all I had. And the other thing that happened is if I left them alone long enough, they would help each other. So that's the other thing I learned is that the, that they would sit there, the, the smart ones that got done quickly would go around and help, help the other ones oh, yeah. after mm -hmm. being asked like, hey, it'd be really great if you just see how other people are doing. And that's all I had to say. And they were all like working with each other. And then the things that they couldn't figure out were the things that I answered. You know, and and it built better a better community among the class. The class was more cohesive to each other because they were helping each other. Um, they were learning faster, like almost by an order of magnitude. Like it was almost like I didn't have enough. Con what what I couldn't get through the first year I taught, I was now getting done in half the time of the of the whole course, and so now I had to make up new stuff because they were just just churning through it, Going and it was just it. a huge eye opener for me that I should not be lecturing ever. You know, like to, to, to do that stuff, you know, like, and so everything after that was all movies. The, the other thing that I, we did a, a court, we did an event with uh, Elon Musk and, and Richard Branson where they just talked and they answered people's questions. And it's on, you can find it if you do Google for entrepreneurs or whatever, you'll see this very low resolution version of these two, of Elon's in a big purple chair mm -hmm. and, and um, Richard Branson's in Necker Island, Necker Island. And uh, it's a little rough at the beginning, but if you cut into the middle of it, you have these two people that are a profound, whether you agree with them or not, they are, they are profoundly changing our world. They have, a, they have a very powerful connection to how to make things happen. And they're answering people's questions. And oh. I, I, what I realized from that was you'll never, those people would never teach a course. <laughs> they were never going to go to a university. The best you can do is get them to get into a conversation and then get them in front. They were doing this in front of 5,000 people because that's what we were streaming to YouTube. Get them in front of as many people as possible. How do we get experts and distribute their knowledge in real time, answering real questions to as many people at a, at a time as possible, and then fill in all the gaps with everybody else? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, the idea of um, asynchronous learning, so that idea that learning is not happening in real time. It, and so not... Not thinking about that in terms of COVID, but thinking about that in terms of the students who are physically in your classroom, but they're just learning at a different pace. So by preparing those students and giving them the opportunity to really think about and engage with the material that you're trying to trying to teach and put across within their own time and how they learn best. And you're coming in there in a just-in-time instruction. So you're there and you're able to support and, and see that they need help. But at the same time, too, that might not be happening in that old, old idea of a direct teacher instruction. So just learning happens, but it always happens at, at a different rate for different students. Absolutely. Yeah. My aha moment, um, and we're running close to the end, so I'll try and make it short. I was involved in the video production portion of an interactive experience called principalship training. It's impossible to send uh, administrators into a school to learn to be a principal with a real school because everyone will be on their best behavior. So a team of uh, professors got together and created a program that would run on a computer desktop. You had a phone, a computer, and a bunch of paperwork that you had to accomplish each day. And the phone was meant to interrupt you. So grad students were on the other end pretending to be parents who were upset about something and then you had to deal with them and it took the time away from what you were doing. And the principalship session was two and a half hours. So you had to accomplish this pile of paperwork, deal with these things on the video and send delegate stuff to other people and while still getting yelled at. And it really put pressure on people in real time. They actually broke into sweats uh, in these courses. It was a 10 week course. And then they would have a debrief afterwards and everyone sat in a circle and the professors would sit with them and ask them how the experience went, where the problems were. And for me, the aha moment was when one student uh, was frustrated with this, how do you hang up on a parent? You can't do it. And how long should you be on the phone with them? And that was the whole lesson for that two and a half hours was the time management that is really a problem in re the real school environment. And it was, for me, the aha was that these people had to share that question. And then somebody in the circle had the answer. They said, oh, here's what I do. And then the other people all nodded and went, oh, well, that makes complete sense. Yes, of course. Yeah. Why didn't I think of that? Well, they were under pressure at the time and they couldn't. 
but someone with experience in that area could contribute to the 15 other people who are taking the course just in that follow-up conversation. And like Brian was saying, sometimes it happens outside your actual uh, classroom event. Let's move. We're, we're going to go a little over time. If it's okay with people, we're going to try and get through these last few questions. Next up. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada, again, asked, what is the future of distance education? Is it the future of all education, just a contingency plan for classroom disruption, or an informal tool for personal and corporate growth? Okay, I've got some ideas on that, but we'll start with Alex. Yeah, I think one possible, and again, I think Arizona is going to be a really interesting model because it, it's the probably the most open voucher system where students are just getting seven thousand dollars to spend. Um, you know, or that's how I've read it anyway. <laughs> you know, to, to spend on their parents are getting seven thousand dollars to spend on their kids, um, and that that's going to be really interesting. I think that th there needs to be a mix between kids being able to hang out with each other um, and being able to have these scalable classrooms. What I don't think you need to do is have the students necessarily in the same physical place as the teachers are. In fact, I don't think you necessarily want that. That gets back into the hybrid thing. I think the teachers need to have, I mean, this is one possible future, where the teachers have a great studio where they can project it to lots of students and they can interact and all those screens are in front of them and everything else. Now, there's there can be a teacher's assistance and all kinds of other things in a more local place. But when we separate the need to teach at the physical location that the students are in, we then get to basically build pods. And these could be at a farmhouse, it, I mean, in a, in a barn. <laughs> they could be at a library. They could be at a church. They could be at a lot of other things. They're not teaching there. They're simply providing a safe environment for the students to be in um, for the day because part of this is how do we deal with the parents, you know? And so, like, the parents need to drop the kids off somewhere. <laughs> so, so if they can drop them off... Yeah. Um, you know, I would love to drop my kids off at a farm where they work on the farm and they take two or three hours of cl online classes that the farm with a gigabit of ethernet and they, they take a bunch of classes. They, they milk cows, they learn how to, you know, do all the things on the farm. And then they, mm -hmm. and, and that's, and we drop them off at eight and we pick them up at four or whatever. And then people can have their work day and, but they're learning lots of other things that, and someone else might want that to be more of a gym and some might want it to be more of a, a, a some a art or music or whatever it is but or they science, get surrounded yeah. by those things in that oh. pod but that's not where they when, when they get a class they sit in front of a screen and interact with someone who has all the tools that they need and those classes can be those teachers can be a one-time teacher that is Neil deGrasse Tyson it can be a regular teacher that's teaching for 3,000 students at one time it is a uh, you know sometimes you know and all of those bits and pieces and then they have ways that online they can get to um, teacher's assistance that, that can help them with the, the things that they need, but building the tools that allow them to do that. But by separating that out, they can have the experience that the parents want them to have to grow in the direction that they want to grow. Um, it also just reduces the, and some students will just do it from home. You know, one thing we found is that about 30% of the students don't really want to go to school. They, they want to learn. They just don't want to go to that environment. The second thing is, 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 is allowing students to reorder based on their knowledge. So rather than saying you're in grade four and everyone has to, this gets into the heterogeneous thing of everyone knows something you could, once they're not in the same classroom, once they don't have to fit into this box that we've created, we can align students in a virtual classroom based on where they are, where they have, where they, you know, where they've shown that they are. So students mm -hmm. that are at a certain, let's say if, if math is one through 1200, Students at 600 to 650 are with a certain teacher and a certain team that's helping them move to the next level, but they could be, the range of age could be two or three years, you know, mm -hmm. in time, but they're in the same development space um, as they go through that. And you can do that if you do virtual classrooms, you cannot do that if you do it in physical classrooms. And yeah. so as we start to trans transcend time and space, we're able to start, you know, doing much more complex relationships between the students. These, uh, these are the challenges against streaming people. Yeah. Um, Chris, make it quick if you can. Yeah, my quick production, uh, prediction is that the d distribution of the learners will precede the distribution of the teachers. I think teachers still yeah. love to come together uh, on a quote unquote campus or a studio, we could call it, uh, and uh, interact with each other and have the the human beings who are in the back end available to keep keep that system going rather than depending on mm -hmm. individual homes setups and the the vagaries of Wi-Fi and so forth and so on. So in the interim, I think the smart school districts will create 
spaces where teachers can come together to do their separate teaching to distributed pods of students, as Alex imagines, but that the teachers will still be wanting to come into one um, co common location. Classrooms are great studios. Mm -hmm. They make, they're nice and big. You can put a lot of stuff in them. John? I think in the short term, it will remain a contingency plan for snow days or disruptive days. I think in the long run, um, because of the cost savings and value added by having the ability to um, distribute education and have, you know, people really specialize in a certain aspect because the best teachers aren't always the best lecturers and the best instructors. Uh, they might be, there's different jobs a teacher has and we'll be able to separate those out to different roles. And I think there will always be some amount of in-person schools at certain locations for the students who want it. But I think the long-term future is parents and kids will be able to find and decide on a school that works for them. And I think we'll have to do that because um, there's been a huge uh, number of teachers leaving the school systems, as most people know. We had we've hired three teachers in a call center in the in over summer. People who said it's better to have an entry level call center job than to go back to the classroom, and it's astounding. Um, but we also offer people to work from home, and so we'll be. Yeah. I think schools will need to be able to do things like that by hiring the best teachers to create the instructional materials for large groups of people, the best tutors to to tutor virtually or in person, and the supporting facilities to do those sorts of things as well. I'm seeing real estate ads in our neighborhood for new houses or rebuilt houses with a Zoom room. And when people are at home are accommodating some distance access, whether it be work, learning, or just for fun, it's going to be ubiquitous. So then at that point, those people will have an advantage and other people will want to join into that. We'll finish with Brian on this question. I think you have to ask, what is distance learning? Like, what is distance when the computer's straight in front of you? Because if you ever watched a how-to YouTube video, you've just done distance learning. So really, as we get more used to sort of this engagement between um, learning when we need it and learning when it's just in time, um, we can start to think about accessing learning in all different manner of ways. Mm -hmm. Yes. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, Alex, you mentioned not caring about accreditation or certification. In many industries like IT use certifications as gatekeepers for jobs. Do you think that will change over time? And go ahead, Alex. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't care about them. There's still people who do. Um, you know, so so the uh, so you know, like it. it so um, uh, I think that that what you're seeing though is the erosion in some industries of needing a college degree. So, uh, if you look at Grow with Google, if you look at you know essentially what, in some ways, what Apple's doing with um, just just the, uh, playgrounds, you know, and, and basically really trying to engage students from the time they're in grade school. What you're looking at is that the university systems are not generating enough qualified individuals at the rate that's necessary for the industry. And so the industry is going around them like anything, any other, you know, anything in nature when something's holding something up and something else needs it, if it needs water, <laughs> like it's just going to go, the roots are going to go around it. And so basically the industry is starting to go around uh, this traditional educational structure because the educational structure is not product as productive as the industry needs. Um, and so that's generally how that, that happens. Um, it doesn't mean there's no certification. Google has its own, you know, Grow with Google has its own certification. But um, we, we can expect to see the industry getting much more aggressive about that over time, not less aggressive because they just need more people than the universities can generate. John? I'll disagree slightly with Alex. I think all of us would like a certified surgeon, uh, someone who's at least demonstrated a, a minimum capacity to keep people alive. So certain roles, I think, will always have something like that. But I think most industries that use certification as gatekeepers, they use them as proxies rather than gatekeepers. It's, it's just to see, has this person demonstrated a minimum amount of skill so I don't have to do the effort of following a background, seeing their actual work, so I can see if they're worth interviewing. Because many IT jobs, if you can demonstrate that you have the skills, um, you know, if you designed and programmed 
the entire website for YouTube, let's say, uh, no one's going to care whether or not you passed a certain HTML class um, because your work shows it. And so people in the hiring industries typically use those as ways to say, has this person shown, at least to a minimum degree, that they can do the basics of this job, which it's a filter to get through the first stage of, of the recruiting process. Well, and the one thing I will say about you're absolutely right about certification doctors. Um, it, it, the, uh, but that's also the same with what we can talk about whether it's, um, I think doctors is a perfect example. What they have proven over a very long period of time is an incredible amount of operational experience. You know, and, and, and that's what, you know, theoretical experience is, or theoretical knowledge uh, is becoming, is rapidly becoming not useful and potentially dangerous. Um, you know, and so theoretical knowledge is a very dangerous thing in most in most areas because it makes you think you know something that you don't. So you're, you know, where you think the chair is isn't there because you've never seen the chair. You know, and so what doctors have when they get out is they have a lot of operational knowledge and, and it's certifying that they did those things and that makes them valuable. But, but thinking that you know where it is, uh, we don't want someone who passed a bunch of tests on how the body works and then have them operate on us either. Right. And there are bad doctors too. <laughs> yeah. So I'm reminded of an article this morning I read from Temple Grandin, who was talking to a surgeon who was complaining that his newest students have limited uh, capacity with scissors and they didn't learn in grade school or kindergarten how to properly use and be accurate with scissors and they had to learn it as surgeons. And he was a little worried for the future of surgery if kids don't play with scissors anymore. Uh, we're going to go to our it's, last but question. running is still out. Running yeah. is still out. <laughs> we'll go to the last question here and wrap up the show. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania says, what type of local infrastructure would be a good investment for a distributed education facility where physical or practical training topics are desired? So I'm going to go backwards this time and give Brian the start. Okay, so um, public schools. So they're everywhere, they're in suburbs, and they actually have great facilities that a lot of people can't actually access. So when you think about things such as musical equipment, um, metal and engineering, uh, kilns for ceramics and art, and uh, agricultural equipment, all of those things um, that you can't actually access via computer online or in your own home. So having public schools with that type of infrastructure where students can get hands-on skills with them is the best investment we can give. Mm -hmm. I often used to say that you couldn't teach phys ed over the internet, but I'm wrong now because of YouTube. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I think that um, what, one of the other things you want to look at is what can you do before they get there to make sure that they are the most efficient when they arrive. So a good a good example is like again the kiln. There are things that they can they can learn how to shape some of those things at home. Use their uh, their their home oven. Use other things to do basic ideas and to understand basic shaping and so on and so forth. And then at some point the infrastructure require, required required um, needs to be there. The other thing to think about though is also. Students at a certain point in time could be provided tools at home. We've seen this in some of the, um, in a couple other countries where they all send equipment to the students. And we asked why, and they said, because it's cheaper than having a classroom. Like we have, we have all the overhead of a classroom that's there when I can send them some small things at home and have them do them at home. It was actually the, it was cheaper to send equipment to their house. Um, in this case, it was, I think, microscopes, relatively inexpensive microscopes. Um, it was cheaper to do that than and, and not have a, a physical experience. Um, but they then worked through how to use them. Now, they used simulators before they got to use the actual one. And, but then they had to have the physical experience. But there are things, obviously, where you have infrastructure um, and there is a value there. But the key is how much can you simulate and how much can you get them to a point where the physical is now really important and they can move through it quickly um, there's in the military, they're doing a lot of testing with this in VR where, you know, it's really expensive to have someone um, do certain things with a tank or a plane or, or whatever. So let's do as much as we can in VR and have you get as, as accustomed to it as possible so that we're not spending $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 an hour for you to learn how to, to do something that we could have done first in, in virtual reality and then in, in physical reality. I once saw a demonstration of a laser disc which taught welding, gas welding, and they had a plastic um, torch 
and you laid the torch on the video screen and turned the knobs and the flame would change according to where you turned the knobs. And then you learned to tune the thing with the two gases to make the right torch flame. And all of this was just a video playback that adjusted to what the novel, nozzles on this, uh, this torch was. Uh, I never saw it used in real life, but at the time, very impressive sort of mimicking and virtual training. So when I think about uh, torch, I just think of how how I learned to do it. We just turned the oxyacetylene <laughs> torch on and lit it and started cutting metal that was laying around in the shop. <laughs> yes, and then you find the best way to do it over time or at the at the feet of a master. Uh, Josh will bring us home here on this question. Yeah, um, thanks for your uh, suggestions on this. It's actually got me thinking a little bit. Um, typically, the way that things work is uh, a certain art class has a certain has one kiln, and the, the students have forty to forty five minutes to use their kiln in the art class. But if you're already distributing the learning, why not just have like time space for a specialized equipment that when they're ready for it? So you've done all of the prerequisite work. You've got them done and they've done everything they can do and now they just sign up for using that tool at a certain time and that way too that equipment doesn't just run eight hours a day that equipment can run 24 hours a day and you can use that distributed it's the same thing that scientists do with time on the hubble space telescope you know it's not just whenever we're up and awake we get to use the telescope they they subscribe that time space out so i'm wondering if it might be actually a better um utilization of specialized equipment in this model uh, well that's and an also interesting think, idea also yeah. think about local kilns that aren't as far away you have a big big kiln that you can that needs to supply a lot of people but you could have you know a kiln might be a thousand two thousand three thousand dollars you could have many of them in the region or all over that you could subscribe to oh there's one available and it'll cost you a little bit to go into it um, and build a network of folks that can do that as opposed to having to go to one place that had all the kilns that's kind of like the makerspace uh, concept that libraries are adopting now. It's just to provide a bunch of resources that people can access casually or bring problems to and have people help them solve it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to close up here now because we're way beyond time. I'd like to thank all our producers for their questions and comments and my panelists as well for their insights. And, of course, the many volunteers behind the curtains who operate the systems that bring you this experience. We hope you've seen something that makes you want to explore more, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, guys. Going to the best bookstore in Northern California right now. I'm gonna leave. It's, it's all about, it's just architecture and design. There's a whole bookstore in Berkeley. They're not selling the churros at the at the farmers markets for the next two weeks. So we not oh, going. we're boycotting. So you're doing something else this time the, because there's no churros, and that's the, it's like the first thing we do is we get churros. <laughs> churros. But we don't. But we're gonna go to the go take. I'll take some pictures of it. You gotta see it. It's My like son and I have the same small. thing with uh, ice cream bars. We could we could go Big to the small just to get ice cream bars. Yes. At Kmart. Yeah. Kmart. You can get churros. Books are still cool. Popcorn. We just got popcorn at Kmart.